Well, you make a point about like just making effectively a spin of things, and that's that's the what reason I don't really talk about distros that much. Like are you, there there are people who do these distro reviews on YouTube, and it's just like, yeah, but if I look at something that's Debian based. It's probably just going to be some sort of Ubuntu-like flavor. Or, like, technically, mm. Ubuntu has a enough of a distinction from Debian to be its own base. Mm. But then, like, you know, you have your Arch-based systems, your Gentoo-based systems, your uh, Fedora-based systems. And, that, like, for the most part, that's pretty much what you get. Like, there are these little projects, but mm. for the most part... Tastes and flavors. Like, people have talked about, like, hey... Would you rather use Arch Linux or Endeavor OS? Like it's, it Endeavor Arch. is just Arch Linux with an install script. Like it, that's that's all yeah. it is. Yes, yeah, it wouldn't get beyond because it is like and don't get me wrong, I'm not belittling on the work that each distro does. No, no, I'm. I mean, some of them do. Like and and Cache OS solve an upstream issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Cache OS, mm. they like you know they get a lot of praise for their kernel work. Like that, yeah, absolutely. But like a lot of distros mm. just, they're just not really doing anything they're variations of defaults yeah 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 and, and that there's gotta be other some. ways of doing that right yeah it was so that's an interesting little segue into something we're doing the circle so remember i said earlier on it's like we pretend to be imperative mm. now that's not to say that we're entirely declarative because the what's in etc and var are basically your problem right now mm -hmm. they're yours uh but a package in Serpent OS is not allowed to contain any other file than the user tree. It's literally, it's unsupported. We will not allow Boulder to generate a package that does that. And implicitly, we've stripped the prefix from all paths so that it has to be slash user as the basis of all paths. It's <laughs> impossible to install a package that contains anything other than the user file. So we had to force the stateless. Um, so that kind of means that anything that's in ETC is basically that is that is yours. We ain't touching it. There's no possibility for a conflict. If you want to reset your system, just delete it and reboot, and you're back to the way it came from default. Yeah, <laughs> it's a little bit slightly more involved. But basically, you generate a new transaction with MOS, and it would rerun any uh, triggers mm -hmm. like uh, running LD config and temp files. It would rerun all of those, but by and large. You could implement this as like a, a boot script, to be honest. You know, like it runs in the internet RD, just wipes ETC, boots again. One of the things that we have been exploring as we're going forward, we're like we've got this, we got this version of MOS, we got this version of the Stone format. We're quite happy with where they're at. We've already planned for the V2 stuff, which is like supporting FS Verity by encoding the digest, having Moldy Sig, and sorry, we're not doing Sig Star. We're not OCI. I'm not happening. <laughs> it's just some things are just ruthlessly applied where they're not relevant and this is definitely a case which is literally is not relevant we own our own binary encoded format we can just transcribe a, a log into that mm -hmm. you know we can just use the hmac of the prior entry and you know it, it's not hard we can have a ledger inside every single part. anyway what we're going to do next is have a system model okay it's not our idea if you think about when you're on gen 2 or anything like that you you have basically your model is defined as your file, which says this is world and this is what I'm having to include. And every time I do a build, this will get added in, right? <laughs> <laughs> so we are going to do nothing like Gen 2. <laughs> I just didn't name drop them. Um, we're going to have a system configuration file or a series of files, which will define what your model is supposed to be. So the, the, the basic idea, well, the basic problem that we've run into, even though we're emulating the imperative behavior, is still a proper pain in the hole because as you're updating over time, you have to differentiate between what's allowed to stay installed and what needs to get pulled in, mm -hmm. which means you have to deal with, does the system provided version provide the dependency I'm already looking for, or is it provided in the repo? So you have a distinction which is corrosive, really. Mm -hmm. A good example of this was the Sting package that we have in Serpent. So... We were doing some testing. This never got released to anyone except I saw it. We were originally using LibArchives, BSD towers, the same tower. Worked fine for ages. Steam will only work with GNU's tower. That's the only one it's going to have. So I was like, okay, well, I'm going to swap over the dependency and make it happen. Now, in Serpent, we have 
variations on named providers where you can say, I depend on a binary or I depend on a soul name. So it depends on binary tar. That, that's simple. So I rebuilt now uh, LibArchive to drop the tar link and I rebuilt, um, so I added GNU tar. So that the only provider in the entire repo of user bin tar was GNU tar. Mm-hmm. Unless you already had tar installed from LibArchive, at which point there is the distinction, well, it's already satisfied, so I don't need to go fetch an update. <laughs> and that becomes a proper pain in the arse. And at that point, everyone's like, use a sat solver. No. <laughs> instead, <laughs> instead, we're going we're gonna to fix the problem. Okay. We're, we're not interested in the theory behind the maths. <laughs> we're going to fix the problem. The problem is very, very simple. At any given point, whatever ends up on your system, really what you want is how it's represented in the final repository. That, that's it. You don't want any other distinction from that because that's the way it's packaged. Mm-hmm. There shouldn't be a variation just because your system's fucking weird, right? And that's where a lot of bugs do come in when we get partial updates. So I've refreshed my repositories. Um, I'll go and install a package. It sees the new version of the package. It pulls that one in instead of all the upgrades I also needed and fucking system host. We've all been there. It's horrible. So we said, we're not going to allow that anymore. There is no concept anymore of what is installed. There is only what your system model says should be present in a newly computed transaction. Mm-hmm. Because we realized we didn't need to remember what was already in any way because it's fucking nonsense. That was the last stage. That's yesterday's news. We're producing an entirely new version of the operating system locally every time you do any operation. So why do we need to remember the old dependencies? Why do we need to remember all of the transitive depths? It makes absolutely no fucking sense at all. Mm-hmm. Which is we producing it. So if you if you just look at it in the simplest terms, imagine it was like, a, God forbid, a YAML file. <laughs> we got to keep that industry going. Not a fan. Yeah, well, I mean, we're using them at the moment, but we are going to switch to uh, to Cuddle because it's actually a lot nicer. Uh, we've been speaking with Cat, one of the devs as well. We've got a bit of a plan going on there. And it's just like, it's just nicer. It's just nicer tagging things. It's pretty. Uh, YAML can literally die the fire. So imagine you have this file of lines where each line is separated by slash r slash n. <laughs> There's no YAML. Um, every line says, this is a name that I want to solve, or this is a package I want to solve, blah, blah, blah. It would just recompute the entire dependency graph for a new OS install, new transaction. That solves all of the weird dependency issues. If you don't need anything anymore, it's no longer pulled in. It doesn't matter. We can garbage collect it because we delete the old states and then we decrease the reference to the states on disk. Where it gets really, really interesting on that, because if you shared that model and the repository configuration, you can reproduce it on another system. And where it gets more interesting again is we've got something called version repos coming up. So long story short, remember I said earlier on, you will only update to the latest supported version of MOS. That's mm-hmm. the package manager, right? So let's say we've got version 1 of the repo, and it's, it needs version 1 of MOS. And then sometime in the future, there was like a, a version 4, and that needed a certain version, blah, 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 blah. Sure. The way that we're going to do it, we're not going to go back in time and fix an old release. Every time, what we're going to do, we're going to create a new snapshot of the, the repo um, that's immutable, and that has that version working of MOS. So from your local client, you can only see that that version is never going to change. The upgrade path is never going to change for it. Mm-hmm. Now, if you link that, one, that protects us forever because we can keep upgrading. It's just not going to break. It, it's just the way it is. If you then link that with the model idea, you could actually export a lock file which references those unique versions that you had at that particular time and exactly reproduce that install somewhere else. Mm-hmm. because you've locked those versions. Yeah, so you kind of get like cargo locks for an OS at that point. That starts to get a little bit sexy. Then we thought on it a little bit further, and we thought, okay, we kind of have this problem with co-installability, which is a bitch, which normally is solved by having conflicts between packages, which is messy, really. And then we've all suffered update alternatives for years, which is it's also kind of messy, really. <laughs> then we realized again, why would we update any sim links? We're producing the entire fucking file system every single time. It makes no sense. So then we thought, well, what if we had a way to augment the dependencies with a path, 
like a named subscription. So that if I say for Clang, my name subscription is 80. Mm-hmm. By overriding that bit of dependency management, the path that it follows. So if you imagine Clang was actually a virtual package, it's not a real package anymore. It says, I depend on Clang 18 when it says 18. But I default to 19. So I have 18, 19, blah, 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 whatever. We have the default values baked into the show. You'll always get the right version. But by overriding and matching to the paths that are exported, your system is composed based on your preference. So that the right clang is activated because you said you wanted it. Or if you had, say, Python dependencies and you need the 3.11 versions or 3.9 version, the dependency path is met, but that's all that you end up subscribed to and installed on disk. <laughs> if you had two different versions of Steam and one conflicts with the other, it wouldn't matter because the dependency graph itself becomes atomic. And that's where it gets a little bit crazy. Because you produce an entire version of the operating system every time locally, mm-hmm. very, very quickly, you don't have to worry about where the paths are going to be ahead of time because it either works or it doesn't. Which right. means you can, op- uh, you can have update alternatives baked into the operating system at the package level. And you can locally say, well, in my package build, this, this is not working with the Rust version of Core Utils. So for my build, I actually need the GNU flavor, so I'm going to depend on GNU, and I'm going to tag it with the GNU one. So you're still saying, I need binary LS, for example, as your dependency. You're not saying, I need GNU core utils. Mm. But you might tag that binary LS and say, I need the GNU version of that, because we know that's a dependency. <laughs> so for that build, it would build using that. On your local system, you might be using the default, which is the Rust version. But if you had problems with it, you could override that and all of a sudden you've got the new one coming in because you're using the capabilities rather than the package names. And that's the distinction. Nobody should care about the package names. They're boring. They're uninterested. They're just basically slots on a database. Sure, Nobody sure. gives a shit. But if you say, like, I need user bin RM, well, that makes sense. You know, or if I need a certain soul name, like libz.soul.1 x86 64. I don't care if it comes from Zlib or Cloudflare Zlib or Bob's Warehouse Zlib or whatever, you know, or where you write it in Rust Zlib, I don't care, I just need Zlib. But I need a way to override it when it makes sense and also have that same default. So I'm not creating this absurd, you know, exponential text and test matrix. You still have the distro is built one way, mm-hmm. but you still then get co installable tool chains and the, the ability to change between them as you need. <clears throat> so when in Moss you don't have an upgrade, you have a sync, which should be very at home for the Pac-Man users among us. When we say sync, it's we don't care what's newer or older or it, that. I know that sounds absurd. It really does. But we, we literally don't care. We only care that the package is different. So the way that we build the graph, it's just a, in theory it's just a simple directed cyclical graph and then we topologically sort it. But that's actually built on top of a providers and dependency system, which is also built based on top of layer priority layered plugins, which is how one repo can be hired and another, but you can still have a leak from one to the other. So if this one has a name and this one has a name that's different, mm-hmm. you know, one excludes the other, but if this has a dependency that wasn't there, this one's seen. So it's that, it's that sort of idea. Um, it allows it to have a lot of fucking powerful features at basically no cost, just by this basic concept of, why don't we just reproduce the entire operating system every time we do a thing? Mm-hmm. And by making that cheap as chips, as I said, we went from every transaction being about 30 seconds, now being a couple of seconds. On top of, you know, we're doing parallel decompression, we're using Z standard for all of our payloads. You know, we're parallel fetching things, so like you've got like eight packages downloading at a time, and you know, so it makes it frighteningly quick just to do a transaction, like to remove that or to add that or thing. And every transaction is just a free copy of the OS reproduced. And then icing on the cake. So let's say every one of your transactions is only taking up like a couple of megs on space because it's all, it's really the weight of the directory structure. Mm. Most of it's just hard links. So they're like what, 4K per node, yeah? Mm-hmm. Because we have that entire directory structure on disk still, you actually still have your last OS on disk every time you make a transaction. 
just by the nature of how it works. Mm -hmm. So it came for free. We produced this, you know, this deduplicated shallow copy of the operating system every time. It's like having all these Git shallow clones on disk at different tags. Yeah. We can now just boot back into the last one. It, it's that simple. Mm -hmm. Like you just swap the user tree again, that exchange mechanism I spoke of earlier on. Mm -hmm. We just swap for the older one instead of swapping for the staging one. We say, no, actually, I want 192. I'm just going to swap back for him and then boot. So we added that a little while back. Um, during during Draco, basically, like in an RD, before everything is mounted, it finds your disk, Draco mounts your disk, puts it in place. And this was actually inspired by the way the OS3 guys have done it. Didn't have a look. But when it's mounted to slash this through, it's you can see your operating system there. We've got MOS actually built inside the init RAM disk now. And then we just point it at the installation. It's like, yeah, can you just roll back the state? And it just swaps the directories over for us using the rename exchange. So it's an atomic rollback before we've ended early boot. So system D hasn't even kicked in properly. We've got the, the init RD version of system D. We haven't done the handover yet. Then it's handed over. Everything starts with the right links, the right files, the right version of the operating system, the right defaults. So it was really, really, really fucking cheap. Uh, I think it only adds like, well, now about just under two seconds in the delay. Um, that's to do with some weird resolution thing for the, the root of S. But long story short, free rollbacks. Atomics is basically the way to do with everything. If we hadn't if we hadn't gone atomic first, we wouldn't have been able to solve these problems at all, to be honest. Mm 